Hello and welcome to A Story Told Three Times and Still Unfinished. My name is Iqbal Singh and I'm part of the outreach team at the National Archives. It's been a delight to work with Mel and Tamasha again as part of our programme to mark the 75th anniversary of the arrival of the Empire Windrush. Tonight's play is a beautiful piece of writing, sensitive, lyrical and very affecting. As a play, it works in three parts, its onion-like quality, peeling away at powerful truths, and sits neatly alongside our wider programme around archives and emotions, exploring the intersection between archival records and family and community memory and the entry points into intimate and personal experiences. The play offers memorable metaphors for the many challenges located in understanding the migrant experience, which will resonate long after you've listened to it. At the same time, there are many jumping off points for further conversations and inquiry. The play will run without interval and will be followed immediately by a Q&A between Mel Pennant, the writer of the play, and the artistic director of Tamasha, Uja Gai. The audio is accompanied by a transcription. However, to enjoy the sound quality at its premium, it's recommended that you listen via headphones. Please enjoy the play. Thank you. A story told three times, but still unfinished, by Mel Pennant. So, every other Tuesday, I meet up with my sister, Glory. She's a year, three months and two days older than me. She came first. She's more sophisticated. Well, put together. Uh... <laughs> Taller by half an inch, always on time. I always get a hot chocolate with marshmallows and sometimes cream. She always gets a skinny, skinny latte, latte, oat milk, oat milk hot, hot milk, milk, in a, milk cup, in a not cup, chipped. not chipped. So, what's your big news then? <laughs> I've only been commissioned to write a play. <laughs> and it's actually gonna be put on. <laughs> So, come on, T. Tell me all about it. All right, well, um, it's got to be a play with a historic angle. Is that it? But that's broad. Well, actually, it's got to be about Windrush. Windrush 75. And there's this silence. Windrush 75? But wasn't that like back in June? <laughs> what, like black history is only ever in October? <laughs> Shut up. I'm making this funny face. That's because she's normally the one to come out with that kind of stuff. Sarcasm. I've only got one sister. She's it. And we know each other like the back of our own hands. So why are you? She's looking at me hard. To write the play. To write this play, I mean. I blink. I presume it's not just because you're... And now she's given me a funny look. The silence and the look says it all. I'm an aspiring playwright. I can write about anything, don't you know? The oh dear look turns to concern, and that's when she turns her eyebrows up. I'm, I'm thinking of making it about Great Auntie. Um, what, what was her name? You know, um, uh, mum, mummy used to take us to visit her in Easton. Um, I remember she always used to say, I was one of the very first nurses to come here, don't you know? By special invitation of the government. One of the 34. You mean great auntie Dolores, who we hardly knew? Yeah, 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 that's her. Great auntie Dolores, yeah, um, why not? She was from the Windrush generation. Anyway, and your news? She moves in her seat. She does this when she's thinking. I'm thinking of moving. <laughs> You're always moving, G. Yeah, but really moving, moving. If you could live anywhere in the world, T, anywhere, where would you live? Me? I've never really thought about it. It's your coffee. And your hot chocolate. Mm, thank you. 
And my sister repeats... Come on. Anywhere in the world, T. Turns out my sister's got a little list on her phone. Where's good, Where's good? she corrects. Safe. And adds... Not racist. For black, for black people, people to, live, to now. live now. My sister flicks a strand of her long extension. She'll later tell me that this is when she told me that she has been thinking about this for months. Leaving, that is. But she didn't. She's never mentioned it to me before. And when she mentioned it, then, well, as you can see, it barely registered. It disappeared in her coffee cup. In a slurp. Anyway, this play of yours, what do you know about the wind rush? She says you like I'm still a child. (laughs) My sister's really knowledgeable, so now for the part where I feel like a complete idiot. And she motions for the waitress again. What do you really know about Windrush Tea? Uh, that it was a ship. Oh my God. Tea, is that it? Do you even know it was a Nazi ship before? And everything else? Have you even done your research? (laughs) Yes. I'm lowering my head over my hot chocolate. I lick the cream off my top lip. I don't want her to see my eyes. I'm blinking. (laughs) 38 years of her seeing my eyes means she knows when I'm... You're lying. Oh, my gosh, T. Pre-Second World War, that ship used to propagate Nazi material. It was called the Monte Rosa. And then it was Empire. The Empire Windrush. Not the first ship of its kind. Like, there were others before. For example, SS Ormond. And plenty after. Like the SS Sorrento. And not the first time black people came to England, of course. You know how it went down, don't you? They were called over here to basically save the country. Because after the war, the country needed black labour. Sound familiar? They worked their socks off. Sound familiar? And then the scandal thing happened. Windrush. Empire. One of the names of a ship. The name of a whole generation of hundreds of thousands of men and women that came from the Caribbean to this country, gave their lives to this country. The name of a scandal tea? Yeah. So, what are you going to write about Windrush tea? What are you going to write about that's not already been written before or that's not going to be a bit like... Gloria shifts in her seat, sniffs. What? (laughs) Well, say it then. Trite, or insensitive, or sanitised, or inappropriate, exploitative. The list goes on, T. Hello? The waitress comes back over to our table. Excuse me? Yes. Is this oat milk? The waitress, late thirties maybe, shrugs. She gives one of them non-committal, fleeting smiles and takes the cup. She'll spit in it. The old man next to us looks over. I smile in his direction. He doesn't smile back. This cafe, it's in the posher part of town. Glory always insists it's here that we've got to come, even though the staff are always a bit... And they always seem to mess up our orders. Hence the specificity. Nothing's ever spoken, nothing's ever said, just those looks and all of those pictures on the walls. And then, of course, there's that road around the corner. You know, the one with the name. Uh, It's not exploitation if I'm black. I'm going to keep it small. Focus it on great Auntie Dolores, her history, and what it was like coming to England in the 1940s. She'll be the hero. And now my sister is narrowing her eyes at me. She basically knows my... (laughs) Keep it small. Really? You're going to focus it on great Auntie Dolores, who we hardly knew. Really? That's what you're going to write about? Okay. Well, I hope you're not planning on asking Mummy any questions is all I'm saying. I'm not, I insist. But that's just it. I kind of already did. On the Sunday before the Tuesday, I went to visit Mum and I told her my news. Mummy, 
<laughs> I've finally got a commission to write a play. <laughs> and she stops what she's doing, dries her hands, and she turns around and she hugs me. And when I say hug, I mean really hugs me. She's been on my writing journey too. And then she takes a step back, looks at me, and she takes my hand in hers and she grips it really tight. She says, I'm so proud of you, my B.O.B. Your player will be everything. And I beam at her. And I ask, semi-serious, and so now am I your favourite child? <laughs> and she cusses her teeth like she always does, but still with a smile. And she takes up the dishes again. So this play, Mummy, it's going to be about Windrush Generation. So you're like a part of that. I'm not part of that. Mm, it's all right, Mum. What's all right? Um, that you came here in the 60s. Mummy, like, from Jamaica. So, so technically, you are from the Windrush Generation because that's the label given to people like you who came here between 1948 and 1971. I mean, when did you come here exactly, Mummy? Wait, I'm just going to record this with my phone, Mum. So, Mummy, can you tell me? Noah. We're just about... Noah! OK, then. Well, I'm thinking of basing it, the play, on Great Auntie Dolores. You used to take us to go and see her when we lived in Easton. She used to say she was one of the very first Bristol nurses sent for. One of the 34? So, Mummy, can you tell me about Great Auntie Dolores? Any info you got would be really, really helpful for the play. Please tell me about her. Tell me about you as well, Mummy. So this was the first time my mum told me her story. So listen carefully. It's enthralling, really illuminating. She really gives out a lot of detailed information. What about me? How did you get here? Did you come on a boat? On a boat? Which part? Okay, so how old was you when you came here? Don't bother me with that now, child. Did you come by yourself? Are you immigration now, Tiana? Well, I just... Uh, you never told your story before, Mummy. Come on! I can't be bothered with any of that now. But when, 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 you, when you got here, like... How was it? Cool. And how did you feel? Cool. And... Like, anything else you might want to add? Nope. Pass the dishcloth. Tea man? You didn't. You know mummy when it comes to that kind of stuff. Your coffee. Why do you always want to come here? I'm watching to see if Glory can taste anything. Sometimes, you know, it's just better if you don't say anything. Like, if you just leave it. Glory shakes her head. All I'm saying is you better do your research, T, because you're not getting your stories from our family. And if that's what you promised... And I tried to style it with, like, if it was you, you know, writing this play about the Windrush generation, <laughs> where would you start? With the research? I don't know. Maybe the National Archives, I suppose. I was reading this article about how the mental health records of people so, a week later, I go to Kew in London. That's where the National Archives are. I take the train, get there, put my stuff into a locker, and search the computer for Windrush. And several files come up. Oh, there's already loads of information because of the 75th. I'm initially looking for my angle, though. Great Auntie Dolores. Information about Bristol nurses. The 34. I was one of the very first nurses. One of the 34. 
They sent for me directly, you know? By special invitation. They called for me. So I call up all these files and I start reading them. And that night, when I finally do get to sleep, as I'm tossing and turning in bed, I have the first of this dream that keeps coming to me over and over again in the following weeks. So I'm in a field. I can feel the grass under my bare feet. And there's such a sense of freedom and connection with the land around me. And this field is beautiful and fast. It's so green and, and lush and full, and I can lie in it and I feel the soil and the grass and let my whole body sink. And there's a man in front of me, a man who I swear I've never seen before, but yet he is so familiar, tall and lean, and I can only see the back of him. And I'm watching him work in the field, the skin on his arms are bronzed and taut, I feel like I know them. His arms. Like I've been in them. The way he holds himself is so upright and proud. But when he goes to move off, he has a limp. And suddenly he, he turns and he's got all these things in the breast pocket of his shirt. The whole world in his breast pocket. Including me. No, that, that can't be right. And then he turns and he taps his breast pocket and he says, I never forget you, you know. You are right in here, son. Always. And he taps his breast pocket and pulls out this little photograph, but I can't see the image on it. And I really want to see the image on it. And, And then he's gone. I mean, what's that about? And, and I wake in a sweat. <gasps> and I, I'm already half an hour late for a meeting with my commissioners. I'm back at my mum's. How's the play going, Tiana? Um, I was late. For a meeting with the people that are paying me to write it. Oh, Tiana. And when they asked me what exactly I'm going to write about, I kind of said I didn't know. Um, I was hoping that the research would spark something, but when I went to the National Archives, you know, the place in Kew, I, I couldn't find anything about Great Auntie Dolores. Or anything else, really. And it was all a bit... What, Tiana? Intimidating. Impersonal, dry. Oh, Tiana. Anyway, at the end of the meeting with the commissioners, they're all like, thank you, thank you, and when can we expect the first draft? <laughs> oh, I think I might lose the commission, Mum. <sighs> okay, then. What is it you want to know about Auntie Dolores, Tiana? Look, just anything, anything interesting. Well, Auntie Dolores met her husband, Uncle Dudley, on the ship over. On the ship over? Mm-hmm. As I understand it. Well, she was from Barbados, a young, attractive woman of 20, maybe. And he was a Jamaican. And you know what they say about Jamaicans? What's a good-looking young woman like you doing on a big ship like this all by your lonesome? <laughs> <laughs> when I lived in St. Paul's, they lived across the street from us. And she was your auntie? No, they weren't relations. We knew them from church. Back then, most people went to church. And in particular, your grandfather. He was converted on the streets of Bristol. Grandad became religious over here. We must change from our old selves into something new. Uh -huh. We must be transformed. Mm -hmm. Forget your old sinful selves. 
Forget what you were before and only look to what you can become. Our house? We weren't allowed to have parties, but Auntie Dolores and Uncle Dudley were always having parties. And I used to sneak across the street and listen to the music. And this is when Mum tells me her story for the second time. All because she didn't want me to lose the commission. When I was seven, I was taken to get my passport picture taken. They put this dress on me, but it was a little bit too small and pinched around my waist. So we had to go into Kingston, you know, to get the picture taken. And back then, I lived in St Elizabeth, so it seemed far to me. My granny dressed me. I remember the frills of that little dress. And then the day I left, they put me in this same little short dress and white socks. I was put on a B-O-A-C plane. When I came to this country, the first thing I remember was the smoke. I thought I was coming to live in a factory because of the smoke coming out of the chimneys. And it was cool. It was a different coal to the coal you get nowadays. <laughs> we used to put the jelly and the milk on the windowsill. That's how cold it was. And your mum and dad? Nanny and granddad? My mother? Well, she used to go out early in the mornings to clean. She was a domestic and she worked very hard. I looked after your Uncle Norman and Uncle Stanley them times. Got them up, took care of their breakfast and got us ready for school. And your dad? We hardly ever saw him. He was gone away a lot for work. He worked very hard on the real wheels. But one thing your grandfather didn't tear quite shit. You want some of this? You want some? Well, come and get it then. Hold on. And Mummy goes upstairs and she comes back down with a little stamped black and white picture of a little girl. Looks six or seven, hair parted, huge white ribbons on each side and she's looking straight into the camera. My passport picture. I feel like... <laughs> I feel like I've seen this picture before somewhere. <laughs> oh, you were so cute! <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, what about school, when you came here? At school? I got on all right, I suppose. Did you ever experience any... It was a different time then, anyway. And then she stops and starts looking into the distance. Out of the window. Mummy? You go back to that place, T. To the National Archives and you'll find what you're looking for. There has to be something there of importance to your story. You find it. Do you understand me, Tiana, right? And she reaches out and takes hold of my hand again and grips it in hers. Mummy, um, was there ever a man who used to work in a field that we knew? He used to carry lots of things in his shirt pocket? And my mum's shaking her head no. What man? Um... He had a limp, I think. And I swear, the blood drains from my mum's face and she lets go of my hand. And she rushes back to the hoover again and she does something that... Something that I won't talk about now. Um, it's something that I've never seen her do before. And the next morning, I go back to the National Archives. Despite worrying about Mummy, I spend all day with the archives. I don't leave until it gets dark. It's a week later, a Tuesday, so you know where I am. It was like a light coming on, G. Suddenly I'm seeing all this stuff. They've got the actual entries of the actual names of the people that came on the Windrush ship. The actual paper that was used to record their names. And there's, uh, there's the descriptions of, of what they did, their, their, their class of travel, and, and it's real. Like, 
like they existed. It's not just part of some film. I tell her all about this document I found dated 1949 from an African student who went to Bristol University called Derek Bamuta. He was commissioned, get this, to write a report on black people living in the East End of London. But he says he had no experience at all in doing that sort of thing. As I have no experience whatsoever in the compiling of reports, I'm going to write down my observations in my own way. West Indians, the majority are residents and seem to have little or no inclination of ever returning to their own homes. These people have been more used to the white people's ways of life in their own countries and soon settled down in their surroundings. They are very merry people, but very sensitive. So, are you going to write your play about this man then? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The report is, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not straightforward. I want to tell her that I've started to have another set of dreams. Well, nightmares, really. I don't know whether to tell her, but... Then I do. Um, it's going to sound a bit mad, G, but uh, <laughs> I've started having these dreams that I'm back there in the archives, in the actual papers as the words are hitting the page. It's all black and white. Like, there's no discretion, no grey. They, the words hit the paper hard and unforgiving. They are there, they will always be there, and they can't be taken back or changed. Though in some of the papers you see that <sighs> crossing out, but the original words, the original words are always there underneath. And I kind of get lost in all these words and I can't find myself. I can't find great auntie Dolores, I can't find the 34 nurses or, or, or mummy or anybody that I know. There's so many words, G. But yet, it feels like there are so many missing words. What's wrong, T? Oh, I don't know. It's, just, it's hard to describe it. It feels, um, it feels so, so personal. <sighs> there wasn't much kindness in the words. Kindness? What was you expecting, T? Hugs and kisses? Milk and honey? You do know that shit wasn't real. Hey, but it doesn't make any sense. Great Auntie Dolores said she was called for, right? She was one of the 34, sent for by special invitation. So they were called. But the stuff I'm seeing doesn't look like anyone was calling them, except to call them a problem. The Jamaica problem. The problem of these people. They were called, they weren't called. They were seen as the solution, they were seen as the problem. I don't understand it. I want to tell her what happened after Mummy turned the hoover back on. That I'm worried about her. And I want to ask, Glory, don't you ever wonder why we never talk to or about Mummy's side of the family? But... Glory's distracted on her phone. Are you even listening? Listen, T. Everything isn't just about you and this bloody play. And before I can respond, she says, I've got something to tell you. And she's shifting in her seat. Um, she says, I've been keeping this on the down low because of Mummy. But like I told you before... She never. I've applied for and received a visa and I've booked my flight. <laughs> Well, you, you, you're going on holiday, Glory, when I'm about to do my play. It's a one-way ticket, T. To where? I've settled on Ghana. <laughs> and I find myself laughing. But Glory's not laughing with me. What's here for me now, T? Huh? Like, seriously. I want to be in a place where I'm free. Where I don't have to whisper. I don't have to second guess every decision I make. She's talking, I can get exactly but I'm not hearing what I'm she's saying. And I do this yeah, thing where my body, my whole life. body starts to shake. And I'm, I'm hyperventilating. And, I'll come back. I and I can't control it. I can't Fine. move. And my, 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 my feet feel like lead and my head is all fuzzy and I don't... I 
know what's happening to me. I'm, I'm sinking. And I'm suffocating and, and her hand is slipping out of mine and my clothes feel rough against my body and squeezed in at the waist and my shoes are too tight. My toes are all pushed up in my shoes and I can't control myself and I start to shake and I'm shouting words at her, all kinds of words forming on my tongue and she's crying and I'm screaming. And all eyes in the cafe are suddenly on us. It's six weeks later, and I haven't written a word for the play. And there's a deadline, a proper timetable, a blog. There's meant to be a rehearsed reading. And I can't even get a synopsis together. I don't even know what to write. And I've stopped dreaming about the words and the man. And instead, there's this big hole where he used to be. It feels like my insides have been ripped out. I feel alone all the time. As I enter my mum's house, mum says, why are you wearing a hat in the house, Tiana? And I don't want to tell her that my hair is starting to fall out. Every day I find clumps of it on my pillow. What's wrong with you, Tiana? I haven't spoken to my sister since our argument and now I'm sitting in Mummy's front room because Mummy said if I don't come, she disown me. My sister's late. And when she eventually turns up, she says... How's the play, Tiana? Oh, I want to kill her. She looks removed, her hair's cut, she's wearing a dress I've never seen before, but her face, the way she walks, is all different, shifted. And when she says, how's the play? Oh, I swear she had an accent. She hasn't even left the bloody country yet. Oh, uh, I brought you a latte, it's in the kitchen. Oh, I don't drink those anymore. No, listen here, the two are uno. I'm not having you behaving like this. You hear me? I'm not having it. My mum is waving her finger in the air. My sister just sits there with her face turned away from me. I can't remember the exact words that came out of my mouth. I know they weren't nice, but she said some unkind things too. This is the one life I've got. And this is the one life you've got. And you've only got one sister. Do you hear me, Tiana? Glory! Then Mummy does something I've only seen her do once before. When she was doing the hoovering. She starts to cry. Mummy? Mum! And my mum wipes away the tears and she motions for me to... Go get your phone, Tiana. And you start recording. And then my mum tells us her story for the third and final time. My sister, uh, you haven't got a sister, Mum. You mean us. And I look at Glory because this is how it starts. Dementia. My sister was born on a Saturday. N n no, Mummy. You've only got two brothers, remember? Uncle Norman and Uncle Stanley. But Mummy just continues. And because she was born on a Saturday, my granny gave her the name A. Marie. You've got a sister, Mummy. She was one year, two months, and three days older than me. And she was standing right next to me in that picture for the passport, holding my hand because I wouldn't take the picture unless she was in it. Even though she wasn't, in the end, they cut her out. And because she was the oldest, they must have decided she should be the one to steer. Of course, I wasn't told, she wasn't told. Even though she knew everything. She said England, which is where our mother and father was, was going to be just like heaven. The streets was going to be all white and the queen was going to greet us off the plane and shake both of our hands. And I said, isn't Papa and Granny our mother and father? 
Because them times, I didn't know we had anyone else, you see. My papa and my granny grew us. Lord, my papa was my whole world. I used to lie in the field behind the house as a child and watch him work. I was two when our real parents left us. Two? Mm. And when I got to England, into the little house that I thought was a factory, I walked straight past her. The woman, my mother, she was cleaning. I thought she was the cleaner. <laughs> and she let me go right past her. She didn't say one word. She didn't touch me. I was only seven. My mother would say, Shush your eyes now. You're ungrateful. You is so ungrateful. Look how I work to send for you, and look how you is ungrateful. See, when I came to England, there was already a family. There was two little boys, five and four, born here. I didn't know them, and they didn't know me. And they would say, why are you here? We don't know you. We don't want you here. You're not one of us. And as we grew well, they was the English Pickney. I was the one from Baka Yard, from country, always behind, always running to catch up. Anston, hurry up, hurry up. They already started their story in the beginning. I entered at chapter three. Ernestine. Why well, you haven't cleaned the step yet? Ernestine, go and get your brother's change. Ernestine, what's wrong with your child? You have ears? You can't hear? You have a tongue? Me tell if you speak, shut your mouth. Go, come, sit, turn up. Well, it's what you're waiting for. That's not how you do it. Don't be so stupid. I was only seven years old. And maybe my mother didn't know no better. She was barely a child when she had my sister. Fourteen. Sixteen when she had me. Jesus. It was different them times. But I was a child when I came here. I was only seven years old. And I would say, I want to go home. I hate it here. I want to come home and I don't like you. And they was working hard. Working to send money back home. Working to keep a roof over our heads. Working through brick walls and people telling them they wasn't good enough and they was working hard on being good enough and English enough and trying every day to forget what they once were to be born again so they could survive. You want some of this? Yes, Jesus! You want some? Mm -hmm. When I came to England, I would wake up to find clumps of my own hair all over the pillar. And when I went to school one time, there was blood on my legs. The vessels had burst, you see, because of the coal. I was so ashamed. I didn't want anybody to see that my legs wasn't just like everybody else's English legs. And at school, they called us all kind of names. Sambo, chocolate drops, and worse, the teachers too. And I wrote a letter to my sister. Wrote in the only way I knew how. Dearest Riri, everything fine. It's lovely. And I'm grateful. The streets is white and everything is fine. I didn't meet the Queen yet, but I'm hoping to soon. But one time, in one of my letters, I wrote, I don't like it. I miss you, I miss Granny, I miss Papa, and I want to come home. When can I come home? Please, can I come home? But your Uncle Norman read the letter. You ungrateful picnic about you want to go home. But you don't like it here? Liar! This is your home. Don't ever write such filthy lies. Again! What happened to your sister, A. Marie, mummy? <laughs> and now my mummy's whole body starts to shake. And she's hyperventilating. And the tears. Turn the phone off now, Tiana. Stop recording. Stop recording.
It's Tuesday. It's January. I'm in the cafe. I go to the counter and I wait in line. And I tap the woman in front of me on the shoulder and I say, Excuse me, what do you know about Windrush? And she says, uh, wasn't that a ship? And I turn to the old man behind me and I say, Excuse me, what do you know about Windrush? And he shrugs and looks at me like I'm mad. And I go to another woman and she says, oh, One of them are you, <laughs> political. I order a tea, no milk, no sugar, and a skinny latte, oat milk, in a cup, not chipped, and I go to sit at our table in a corner. And the waitress brings over our order. One tea, one coffee. And I ask the waitress, what do you know about Windrush? And she says, sorry? And I stare and I study the back of my hands. And then I just stare out of the window. And I know you're not coming. But I wanted to tell you that I'm not going to write the play. That important thing that Mummy said I would find in the archives? Well, I found it. Or rather, I've made sense of it. When we stepped off the ship, the cameras, the flashlights were all pointing in our direction, at us. But the camera needs to turn, 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 and face the other way. All the other ways, 359 degrees. You see, this story isn't just about us. And that's what I found in the archives. And we need to have our own conversations in private. The ones between you and me and mummy and great auntie Dolores and grandma and great granddad, the man with the pockets filled with the world and his mum and dad and their 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 mum and dad and we haven't even properly begun to start having those conversations yet. See, what I found out was that it's my story. And I never thought it was before, to be honest. It's mum's story. It's mum's mum's story, but it's also the waitress's story and that woman and that old man at the counter story. It has to be. And the thing is, they don't even know it's their story too. The story that goes so deep and wide and stretches whole continents and whole generations backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. It's about us all. So can you see it, G? That you were right all along. It's impossible to write. That's what you were trying to say. And I can't write the Windrush play. A Tamasha and the National Archives presentation. Written by Mel Pennant and directed by Anastasia Asay Kofor. Sound design by Louis Blatherwick. Featuring Nina Toussaint White as Tiana, Madeline Appiet as Glory, Susan Lawson Reynolds as Ernestine, Great Auntie Dolores and Waitress, Ricky Fearon as Man in Field, Derek Bermuda, Preacher, Uncle Dudley and Uncle Norman, with special thanks to the Caribbean communities of London and Bristol who shared their stories and testimonies. Mm -hmm.